Whenever I heard our, uh, some of our talks, I begged the advisors not to put me after Chris. Please, nowhere near Chris. Whatever you do, don't put me in the blacksmithing hour. Those are my requests, and here we are. So I'm here to tell you about my new and innovative ministry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so whenever I first got the call to start a church for nerds, geeks, and gamers, I wasn't sure what it even looked like. I wasn't sure that it was even going to be possible. But I took my pitch, my call, and I took it to the church developer, Dan Pizzett, in the Western North Carolina Conference, and I told him that I had this vision. I went and I drove and I sat before these people, these church planners, and I told them I wanted to plant a church for my people, my nerds, my geeks, and my gamers. And Dan looked at me kind of strange. He said, well, Nathan, what are your thoughts on Dungeons and Dragons? No, oh, boy. I had to be honest, right? I had to be honest. I had to be upfront at the beginning. I knew the history with Dungeons and Dragons in the church. I knew Satanic Panic. And so I was like, I've got to be honest from the beginning. So I said, Dan, I'm a DM or a dungeon master from my college buddies every Thursday night. Brace for impact. He leans over to me and he says, I DM every Sunday night. <laughs> So there you go. He was a big old nerd just like me. And the more and more that I've gotten into this, the more and more that I've learned that the nerds have already invaded the pastorate. They're already here. The nerds are among us. And so I went into this meeting with Dan and these leaders, and I wanted to explain to them the importance of nerd culture. I wanted to tell them how important nerd culture was being. I wanted to say how difficult it is to find somebody who hasn't at least heard of the latest Marvel movie if they didn't go on opening night. I wanted to tell them about how video games have now overtaken both movies and music combined. I wanted to talk about the market tripling in the past four years in video games alone, and even beyond just numbers and money, people. The San Diego Comic-Con happens, obviously, in San Diego, and there were 130,000 people in 2019, and that's a number that in one weekend would make Joel Olstein and Stephen Furtick both blush. <laughs> Gathering in a single weekend, more than Lakewood Elevation and Saddleback combined. Fun fact, by the way. Rick Warren's favorite anime is Full Metal Alchemist. That's just a, a fun one that I threw in there for free. That's not really a part of the presentation, just something you can take home with you there. And so I went with the intention of proving my point and proving that nerds needed to be reached. They weren't being reached, and we needed to do what we could. And the irony was that Dan proved it right back to me, that the nerds were already among us. If you look at our demographics that we've built up so far in the past year and a half at Checkpoint, we probably have about a third of our people that are usually regularly attending that are clergy people. If you include spouses, it might go up to half of our number of regular attendees are somehow related to the clerical role. The nerds are already among us. And so this calling is not only one that just makes sense, it's not only one that needs to happen because of this just huge group of people, this huge overlap that's already happening, but this was also an emotional one. I'm a pastor's kid. I grew up in the church. I was a big uh, you know, member and a proponent of my youth group. I loved being a part of my youth group, but I was also that kid that started watching Adult Swim way too young. I loved trading Pokemon on the playground. And I had these two groups. I had my youth group, where we'd go and play horse. And then I had my nerds. And there was this unspoken rule that never the two shall meet. And so in college, I really had that illustrated to me whenever I really got in with my nerds, and I felt like my church people were so distant. And so I decided then and there that this was a calling, this was a bridge that I wanted to be. I wanted to serve this role, but that still raised the question. I was still in this uncertain place. What does it actually look like to build a church for nerds? Do we look at San Diego Comic-Con? Do we do this yearly mecca where people gather together? What about barcades or something like that where people come frequently or maybe the coffee shop feel? What do we do? Do we need to be a physical church? But the more that I started to be among the nerds, the more I learned that they were gathering at these mecca spaces and then they were going and they were on the internet. 
They were on Twitch. They were on YouTube. They were on Discord. That is the place that they were naturally inhabiting. But I still wasn't resolved. I still didn't really believe it. And so I've been incredibly fortunate along this path as a church planner to have a lot of mentors and coaches and leaders who have helped guide and direct me. And one of them is Jim Griffith out of Florida. And whenever I met with him, he asked, Nathan, is this going to be a physical church for nerds or a digital church for nerds? I still didn't know. I was still nervous. I was anxious. And so I waffled and I said, well, I don't know, so I think we'll do both. And he didn't like that answer. (laughs) He said, no. He said, either you need to choose to do a physical church for nerds or you need to admit to yourself right now that the digital church is a real thing and that you're going to pursue it. You need to be all in it or else you're not going to be in either one. And so that was the moment where I first affirmed and said, yes, We are going to be a digital first community. We are going to inhabit these digital spaces. And I think that what we're learning is that this is just the bigger issue in the church. We have this issue with, does it have to be digital? Does it have to be physical? Does it need to be a both and? What does it need to look like? How does it need to be? And the bigger question that keeps coming up is, is digital church even a valid form of church? Is it a valid embodiment of people? The truth is, is that it's actually in our lifeblood. It's what makes us up. The reality of these digital connections is that you take away that word digital, and it's the connection that makes us. In our quadrilateral, it's not just our experience and reason of San Diego Comic-Con being such a huge thing and the nerd culture being such a huge thing. It's also in our scripture and in our tradition. Yes, Jesus carried the message on his feet, but Paul wrote. And Wesley sent out the pamphlet far and wide. Yes, nowadays our connection is a little bit more bits and bites and a little bit less horse-drawn. But connection is still connection at the end of the day. The question is not if we will connect as the church. The question is how are we connecting? What are we doing? If we're looking for the tallest city on a hill, what taller hill do you see than the internet? But how? How does this actually look? How do you do this church for nerds? You've heard this argument for the digital church before, right? We're all innovators here. We're not blacksmiths, except for... Maybe one, maybe one. (laughs) Well, the first thing that I've learned in my year and a half at Checkpoint is that we have to get beyond the one-hour model. We have to get beyond the one-hour on Sunday model. We actually need to be uh, live for about six hours. Now, I know what you're thinking. Six hours? I served a rural church as well. How on earth are we going to be live for six hours and still beat the Baptist to Golden Corral? Well, the truth is is that six hours isn't even really enough. We're planning on ramping it up to nine hours at Checkpoint. People want more. They want to be a part of community. They want to be a part of these streams. They want longer streams. There are Twitch streamers that are streaming full-time over 40 hours a week just being a part of this FaceTime. We need to make our FaceTime less formal but far more frequent. So what do we do during these times? We have two hours on Monday that we just play Pokemon. We just play Pokemon together. And I know what you're thinking. They're just playing games together. You set the bar low. You set the expectations low. And I had that same opinion. But not too long ago, we were playing through Pokemon Pearl. And one of our members started to have a conversation about alcohol abuse, substance control, and how they were handling that in their life how they were handling that from their family and from a situation that had happened in their past. This was a heavy conversation. It was a hard conversation that I would not even gotten to after serving in a rural church for four years with some of them. And here I was having it while I was catching a Zubat. It's absurd. It's fine to laugh. It's absurd. It's ridiculous, and yet it is happening. These relationships are happening. The church has been so focused on making our worship more attractive that we've missed the boat on making our relationships more attractive. People want to be a part of community. They want to be in this space. They are hungry 
for it. They're looking for attractive relationships to be a part of. They want to be a part of friendships. They want to play Pokemon together. They want to play video games together. And they want to do that in a community that is safe and welcoming and encouraging. So how does that work? I would encourage you, whatever your context may be, it might not be the app that I use, but I use Discord in our community, and Discord has been a game changer. I will talk your ear off about Discord if you want me to. I will talk the rest of this weekend about that one platform because I think it's such a game changer. But regardless, what it is at its core is it's beyond just posting your live stream to Facebook, and it's asking the question, what does digital community look like? What does it look like to go beyond just me giving you something to us creating community together? It's supportive. We have a whole channel of prayer requests where somebody will just drop a prayer request and then they'll get seven people reacting immediately to their posts and encouraging them and loving on them and checking in on them beyond just the staff. They're just checking on each other as friends. Whenever you enter into our Discord, which I would encourage you to poke around and learn a little bit about, you're going to be welcomed by a cavalcade of emotes and gifts as soon as you walk through our digital doorway. And even more so, I mentioned I'm a PK. I've been in the church my entire life. We were the first ones to the church. We were the last ones to leave. I've been at the church a lot in my life. But never have I experienced a place where whenever we have a slow day at our church building, our digital church building, I'm sad. I miss them. I want to be a part of this thing. And I'm not alone. Our community is becoming closer and closer to 24-7. We had to meet not too long ago and talk about who's going to be available from midnight to 6 a.m. Who's going to be at our church building? Because the people will be there. So who are we going to have in that space? It's become downright monastic. People are just among us. They just are there. Whenever we took our first steps towards leadership with Level 2, a program that we implemented, I was scared. I was nervous because I'd been in the church. I'd served the Royal Church. I knew how hard it was to bring leaders in the hard ask around nominations season. And so I was nervous. And so I posted the form and I thought, oh, I'm going to have to write a letter. I'm going to have to ask people to join this thing. Within 30 minutes of posting that form, I hadn't even shared it yet. We already had two people signed up. Three months in, we have 12 people. They wanted this. Their first question to me was, why did it take you so long to ask us? They want to be a part of this. But the ultimate thing that I've come to conclude is that the digital community at Checkpoint Church is a valid embodiment. It's time for us to get that question out of the way with an unequivocal yes. Digital community is a valid embodiment of the church. If the Fresh Expressions movement has taught us anything is that God cannot be contained to a space that we've built by human hands. We've, be, we're, we've gone beyond that. So I want to encourage you again, what does your digital context look like? If you want to reach the same people, I'll encourage you to do Facebook Live. But if you're ready to reach somebody new, if you're ready to create a digital community, ask yourself, what does that look like? And so we can explore, we can talk about this innovation, we can talk about Discord, and again, I will. <laughs> you can't stop me. But first, we have to accept that Checkpoint Church is made of real digital bodies. We are made up of real digital connections. We are the real digital church. Thank you.